Good evening, curious minds of the interwebs. I'm Alexa, the resident ooky spooky girly around here. And doing research today felt like going through an I spy book from my childhood. With almost everyone always having a camera on them these days, there's a lot of photos flooding the internet. And I can only look at so many blobs or fingerprints that are supposed to be something they aren't before my brain revolts. So none of those made this list, I promise you that. Question for you folks though, have you ever discovered something in a photo that wasn't supposed to be there? Other than someone like crashing the photo that is. Let me know in the comments. And here are the top five scary things hidden in normal photos. In fifth place, we have camp staff taking a day off. Now to the unknown eye, this is a very innocent picture, and you might be asking why it's on this list. No, there isn't a weird creepy face in a corner or something. I'm going to ask you all to pay very close attention to the uniforms that people are wearing. Still not making sense? That's okay, they're all looking quite out of character for what they are. This photo is of Auschwitz staff enjoying pleasant days off. They look like camp counselors, but their job is killing people in horrible ways, and they enjoyed it. Most probably took lives not shortly before or after this was taken. Probably uh, the most unsettling photo for me today, since the absolute contrast makes my stomach turn. Knowing simply how many lives they took, and here they are just, you know, having fun, doesn't sit well with my stomach at all. In fourth place, we have John Lennon and his killer. On the evening of the 8th of December of 1980, English musician John Lennon, formerly of the Beatles, was shot and fatally wounded in the archway of the Dakota, his residence in New York City. The killer was Mark David Chapman, an American Beatles fan who was jealous and enraged by Lennon's rich lifestyle, along with his 1966 comment that the Beatles were more popular than Jesus. He wasn't wrong. Chapman said he was inspired by the fictional character Holden Caulfield from J.D. Salinger's novel The Catcher in the Rye, a phony killer who loathes hypocrisy. Chapman planned the killing over several months and waited for Lennon at the Dakota on that morning of the 8th of December. So he waited for Lennon outside the Dakota in the early morning and spent most of the day talking to fans and the doorman. During the morning, he was distracted and missed seeing Lennon step out of a cab and enter the building. Later that morning, he met Lennon's family nanny. Helen Seaman, who was returning from a walk with Lennon's five-year-old son, Sean. Now Chapman reached in front of the housekeeper to shake Sean's hand and said that he was a beautiful boy, quoting Lennon's song, Beautiful Boy, which is so creepy! Oh my gosh! Famed photographer Annie Lebovitz went to the Lennon's apartment to do a photo shoot for Rolling Stone magazine and promised them that a photo of the two of them naked together would make the front cover of the magazine. So she took several photos of John Lennon alone, and one was originally set to be on the cover. After taking the pictures, she left the apartment at around 3.30 p.m. and Lennon gave what would be his very last interview to RKO Radio Network's San Francisco DJ Dave Sholin and writer slash producer Lori Kay for a music show to be broadcast on the RKO Radio Network. At around 5 p.m., Lennon and Ono, delayed by a late limousine shared with the RKO Radio crew, left their apartment to mix a song, Walking on Thin Ice, an Ono song featuring Lennon on lead guitar at the record plant. As they left the building, they were approached by Chapman, who asked for Lennon's autograph, you know, common practice, on a copy of his album, Double Fantasy. Now, John Lennon liked to give autographs or pictures, especially to those who had been waiting for long periods of time to meet him. Later, Chapman said he was very kind to me. Ironically, very kind and was very patient with me. The limousine was waiting, and he took his time with me, and he got the pen going inside my album, and asked if I needed anything else. I said, nope, no sir, and he walked away. A very cordial and decent man. Paul Goresh, an amateur photographer and Lennon fan, took a photo of Lennon signing Chapman's album, and that's the photo we're discussing today. Later that night, when Lennon and his wife were approaching the entrance of the Dakota building, Chapman fired five missiles from a special revolver, four of which uh, hit Lennon in the back. He was rushed to Roosevelt Hospital in a police car, where he was pronounced dead on arrival at 11.15 p.m. at age 40. Dang, younger than my parents. Chapman remained at the scene reading The Catcher in the Rye until he was arrested by the police. He later pleaded guilty and was given a sentence of 20 years to life imprisonment, oh, and has been denied parole 12 times since he became eligible in the year 2000. For starters, killing someone is an awful crime, and the fact that it was so premeditated is terrifying. But to have a photo putting you at the scene, inserting yourself into the narrative so much, is what's going to keep me up tonight. Sadly, I'm speaking from experience when I say stalkers are creepy and awful, and I have way too much expertise on that matter. In third place, we have human dolls. No, I'm not talking about drag performers. On first glance, you might be looking at the photo in question and think it's a weird selfie or makeup attempt, and you'd be half true, but not in a good way. Anatoly Moskvin is a Russian former journalist, college professor, and self-dubbed necropolist with expert knowledge of cemeteries, which, you know, doesn't sound too bad at first. Kind of similar to me. 
For years, his hobby of collecting dolls hit a macabre obsession that drew upon his particular interests, digging up the dead and making dolls out of their corpses. After making his human dolls, he kept them in his home as his companions and lovers. It is alleged that he placed music boxes inside the mummies, set them up around his living room, and had tea while they were singing for him. I kissed her once, and then again, and then again, Moskvin wrote about one of his dolls, made from the body of an year old. When investigating the apartment, the police captured video footage, and in it the camera moves along the corridor, which is cluttered with wedding dresses and bright colorful clothes, and enters a small room. At first sight, the little figures of girls mounted on top of the bundles of old books and papers, or you know, half lying on the couches, could be taken for big, soft, stuffed dolls. Kinda like a Raggedy Ann. The camera zooms in on their faces, which are wrapped in light beige fabric, and settles on the painted eyes. The girl figure on a couch wears a knitted hat with a pinned rose and lilac sweater, and her legs covered by white tights are elegantly crossed. And the camera moves down to the feet where the girl is wearing white shoes. The next doll in the corner has long curly blonde hair and wears a silk wedding dress with a veil running down to the floor and can't be older than uh, 12. The police report says that Moskvin compiled up-to-date information about the life of each of the women he brought home and printed off from a computer detailed instructions for producing the dolls out of human remains. The police officers who took the video said they each drank a few shots of vodka when they got home, and after reading through the horrors he committed, it's a tempting thought. Police finally caught Moskvin in 2011, after years of increasing suspicion at the growing number of desecrated graves in his home city of Nizhny Novgorod. I tried. When they searched his home, they found 26 corpses scattered throughout. Uh, pardon me, my stomach is already turning and we're only partway through our list. In second place, we have a two-headed dog. So this is probably the only photo on this list that looks a smidge odd at first. But it's not just comical whimsy, and instead this is the work of a mad scientist. In 1959, Soviet scientist Vladimir Demikov actually managed to create a two-headed dog. Previously, he spent the 1950s carrying out research into organ transplantation surgery, continuously improving his experimental techniques. He successfully performed an isolated orthotopic heart transplantation in a dog in 1951, where the heart was correctly positioned rather than offset inside the thoracic cavity. The survival rate steadily increased from a few hours to several weeks, and one of the dogs that received a heart transplant in 1953 survived for another seven years after the operation. So yay! But back to the two-headed yikes we go. After 23 tries that left his canine subjects unsuccessful, he was finally able to achieve a small measure of success. He grafted one head onto the other dog's body, sewed their circulatory systems together, and connected their vertebrae with plastic strings. After the procedure was completed, both heads could hear, see, smell, and swallow. Now sadly, his methods were still relatively crude, and the dog only lived for four days before passing. While his research was a pioneering foray into head transplantation, experts debate the ethics of such procedures procedures to this day. And I'm no expert, but this is something that makes me go, yikes! And in first place, we have the Uruguayan Air Force Flight 571. So this picture was taken of a group of survivors of that flight crash in the Andes. So they're all smiling in the photo, but it becomes eerie when you see the human spine to the right of them in the picture. I'll get to it, I promise. On October 13th of 1972, human error caused the plane and the 45 folks on board to crash into the Andes mountain range in Argentina, just shy of the border with Chile. Amid the wreckage of the mangled plane, on a mountain glacier about 80 kilometers east of the planned flight route, 33 passengers were still somehow alive. Now, five people didn't survive the first night of below freezing conditions on the mountain in the remote Andes, and a sixth person passed within days. Those who were still alive and not critically injured or in a coma used parts from the plane to create shelter, snowshoes, goggles, and also figured out a way to melt snow for drinking water. The survivors had no medical supplies or appropriate clothing, and were stranded on the mountain as temperatures plunged to minus 30 degrees Celsius, which gets pretty dang cold. The little food they had was quickly running out, and in a cruel twist, the survivors had found a transistor radio in the wreckage, and were using it to listen to updates on the search effort. On day 11, they heard the announcement on the radio that the search for them had been called off. Everyone assumed they were, um, goners. Starvation soon set in. Eight bars of chocolate, a tin of mussels, three jars of jam, some nuts and dried fruit, some lollies, and a bottle of wine was all they had to eat, and with all those people, that was gone in a week. Desperate, they tried eating cotton and leather from the plane seats. Okay, uh, time to talk about that spine, eh? Eventually, as the bodies of the frozen dead laid around them, the survivors were forced to consider their only chance for survival. All the passengers were Catholic and held deep moral concerns about eating their relatives, teammates, and friends from school, but as a group, reluctantly decided that eating the bodies of the 
the already dead was their only chance of making it off the mountain alive. They also mutually agreed that if any of them died, the others could eat them for sustenance. Mr. Canessa, a medical student, led the way. He used broken glass from the windshield of the plane to cut off a tiny piece off of one of the frozen bodies. Now, the bodies of the pilot and co pilot were first because the survivors didn't personally know them. It took some of the survivors a while to come to grips with the new source of food, and many struggled to keep it down. One woman who refused to eat eventually died on day 60, weighing just 25 kilograms. One night, an avalanche struck the fuselage as the survivors slept inside, killing eight of them. The 16 survivors were trapped in the snow filled fuselage, buried in snow below their necks until they got free after about three days. And as the pact went, those killed in the avalanche became uh, new sources of food. Eventually, on December 22nd, which was 72 days after the plane crash, search crews finally recovered the remaining survivors. And that brings us to the end of our time, and I suddenly feel like going through old photo albums with a magnifying glass for clues. Oh. I'm the only one, I eh? had a feeling. I blame growing up on Nancy Drew and Carmen Sandiego for that love and curiosity. If you enjoyed my deep dive today, at the risk of uh, throwing up my lunch from grossness, please give this little chaos a like, subscribe, hit the bell for more from us here at Top 5 Scary Videos, and I'll see y'all next time, you lovely spooky people.